Hallelujah. Happy New Year. How is everybody? Great. Great. You know, it's funny, Carolyn said it's my birthday, but I'm actually younger than Carolyn. Six months. And so her birthday's in June, and I always just flip mine in June. So when she reaches the next year, I just mentally go to that next year as well. So one year, I actually, I can't remember, we'll say 50. And Carolyn turned 50 in June. So when she turned 50 in June, I'm like, well, I turned 50 also. And then when January rolled around, I'm like, shoot, I'm 51. She goes, no, you're not. You're only, <laughs> no, you're not. You're good. So uh, I'm just now actually the age that I've been thinking I have been for the last six months. Uh, but you know, the beauty of it is I've been conf confessing the 103rd Psalm since I was about 28 years old. And it says my youth is renewed like the eagle. So uh, I'm going to keep confessing that. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Titus 2, 11. We started on, we talked about this two weeks ago, Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world. This is the verse we are focusing on, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said we're supposed to be looking for the glorious appearing. In fact, we sang it. If you ever wonder how the songs get picked that we do on Saturday night? It's, it's a very sophisticated, we fast and we pray and we, we pray in the Spirit for hours and we let the Lord lead us. Nah, we usually let the kids pick. I usually, whatever kids are hanging around, I'm like, what do y'all want to do tonight? So Landon loves Glorious Day. He was over at our house the other day, and we played it like two or three times, and we get in the car, and he's like, Glorious Day, Glorious Day. So uh, he, he, he requested it today. So if one of your kids wants a song, have them make the request. That's how we pick most of what we do. Um, so we were talking about the fact that the glorious appearing of our great God and that word great is the Greek word mega. We all know what mega means. It's been taken. I mean, if you, what, in fact, for most people, when they think of mega, what do they think of? Mega millions, because they've got those stupid billboards everywhere for the lottery. But what does mega mean? It means huge. It's giant. We were talking two weeks ago about how we have this huge God, and yet we go through life like he's, like he's somehow just a pygmy, how he can't do anything how things are too hard for him. He asked Israel this rhetorically one time. He said, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is no. I, I, when you think about this creation, I was listening to a, uh, I'm, I'm listening to a book online called A Case for a Creator. It's a really great book just to talk about the scientific evidence for God. And he's talking about this last chapter I was listening to coming, coming home from Orange County on Thursday. He's talking about human DNA. And the complexity of human DNA and the scientists have no clue. They have literally no, cue, no clue how the human DNA creates all the different kinds of strands of proteins that it creates. They don't know how it works, how it knows the, what proteins to create and how to distribute them and how to send them to the right places. They literally, scientists that are honest will say they have no clue. It is so complex. It is so intricately designed by our mega God. And we have to realize everything we see, the entire universe, you ever, I mean, you ever look at the stars? I mean, those things are billions of miles away. What you're seeing up there is light from a billion years ago. That light, God said, light be and light was. We have this giant God, in the beginning, God created. And we have to really constantly, you know, why we do praise and worship? You ever thought about praise and worship? Is God an egomaniac? God's egotistical. He wants to be worshipped. You know, no, why does God want us to worship him? Because when we exalt him, the bigger we make him, the more able he is to do things for us. The whole purpose of worship is to make God big for your benefit. He knows who he is. He doesn't need you telling him how great he is. He knows that. He doesn't need you telling him how wonderful he is. He knows that. He needs you telling him how great he is because you need to know it. He needs you to tell him how wonderful he is, so you need to know it. That's the whole point in praise and worship. He's not some egomaniac that, oh, worship me. He's saying, you, you see it all the time this time of year. It's football season. <laughs> I laugh when I see grown men with football jerseys and the names of players on the back. If that's you, I'm sorry. That just seems a little weird to me that a grown man's got some another man's name on his back, you know, Brady 
or whoever. You know. Why do men do that? Why do grown men wear number 12 sports shirts that say Brady on the back? Because they're identifying, they're worshiping Tom Brady. Don't know why, but they are. And they're lifting him up and they identify. That's the whole purpose of praise and worship is to identify. And this is really not my message, but I think we need to understand why we do praise and worship. It's to glorify our God because the bigger he gets for us, the more he is able to do for us. Because as we talked about two weeks ago, David saw a giant God. The rest of Israel saw a giant named Goliath. Caleb and Joshua saw a giant God. The rest of Israel saw giants in the land, the sons of Anak. Every day in our life, we have circumstances, we have problems, we have issues. And the question is, do we see giant problems or do we see a giant God? And that's what we were talking about. Now let's go over to Romans chapter 4. One of the things I was thinking about it, and I, and, and I felt like this is a key to having a, a picture of a giant God, is what we're going to talk about tonight. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. Now it's talking about Abraham. Remember Abraham, when he was 75, God told him he was going to have a son. Sarah had passed menopause already. She was 85. She had passed, or, or 65. She had passed menopause and could not have a child. Impossible. Biologically impossible. You can't get pregnant once you've passed menopause. Abraham was 75. God promises him a child. But it doesn't happen when he's 75. It doesn't happen when he's 85. It doesn't happen till when he's 95. It doesn't happen until he's 99 years old. 99. How did he believe? Because Abraham's called the father of faith. How did he believe? Well, the short answer is he believed that we have a giant God. But there's something more to it. So let's start here. And not being weak in faith, it's talking about Abraham, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. Let's stop right there. You want, a, you want a, a key component? Don't consider your own body. Don't consider your own circumstances. Don't consider what you have, what you can do, what your ability is. Abraham did not consider his own body now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. He was 99. Nor the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He did not waver. Keep going. Number, and being fully persuaded, fully convinced that he would have, what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was counted to him for righteousness. Go back to number, verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. So how, what I want to talk tonight about is how do I keep from wavering? How many of y'all waver sometimes? I do. I'm going to have my hands up. How do we avoid wavering? How did he avoid wavering? How, and, and I think the um, King James says staggering, tripping, staggering at the promise of God. He wavered not. The key is giving glory to God. We talked about this about three or four years ago, and I felt like the Lord wanted me to go over it again. Giving glory to God. What is that Greek word glory? It is the Greek word doxa. It says to signify a good opinion estimate, honor resulting from a good opinion. It says he did not stagger, waver at the promise of God because he had a good opinion, giving a good opinion of God. See, I'm amazed how many Christians, much of the church world has a bad opinion of God. What do I mean by that? Most of the church world believes God kills, steals, and destroys. Now, they wouldn't put it that way because there's a Bible verse that says who kills, steals, and destroys, right? The thief cometh but to kill, steal, and destroy. So most Christians wouldn't actually say God comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but they actually do believe it. Let's think about what most Christians... You want to get Christians mad at you, throwing stones at you, trying to kill you? Preach what I'm going to preach right now. Most Christians believe God will give you sickness. God will give you cancer. God will give you diabetes. God will make you sick. Common theology. Or for those that want to mamby pamby it a little bit, they won't say God will give you sickness. They just say God allows it. Well, that's like if I allow somebody to hurt Maggie, I might as well have done it. You know, what does that mean? I allow it. That's just the, the weak need way of saying God did it. God gives sickness. 
God burns down houses if your house burns down. In fact, they put that in insurance policies, don't they? What's the insurance policy? Also, if your house burns down, an earthquake sucks it down into the ground, it was an act of God. It's, in insurance. it's literally in the law. God burns down houses. God causes earthquakes to destroy houses. God kills children. God, every, I hate Christian funerals. Y'all heard me say this. I hate Christian funerals, especially of children, because they always sound the same way. We don't understand God's ways. We don't know why God took little Billy Bob, but there was a, he needed an angel in heaven, and so the Lord called him home. You called God a murderer. If you said that about my biological father, my, my earthly father, my dad, Watson, if you said that about Watson, well, Watson killed that little eight-year-old because he wanted an eight-year-old in heaven for the Lord. I, I'd pop you in the nose. And yet it is standard Christian theology that God would do that, that God would give you diseases, that God, God would give you cancer to teach you something. I heard Kenneth Copeland say this 40 years ago, what you need to learn, you're not learning. You don't need to learn corruption, death, and destruction. That comes from the kingdom of darkness. You need to learn how to operate in the Father's grace and power and not waver at the promises of God. But you've got to have a good opinion of God. We, when hurricanes come, when tornadoes hit, when earthquakes hit, what are they called? The act of God, judgment of God, God's judging. I remember years ago when Katrina hit, God's judging New Orleans. And New Orleans is a godless place. But so is Richmond, Midlothian. And, you know, when, when a hurricane hits Las Vegas, I will believe that's an act of God. When the hurricane comes across the Gulf of Mexico, lifts up, goes across Texas, in the air, doesn't hit Texas, and then hits Las Vegas, act of God. But until that happens, listen, hurricanes form naturally. Air masses collide. Vortexes are created. I mean, I'm not a weatherman. It's just a natural consequence of this fallen world. It's not God. What else does God do? God created AIDS to judge the homosexual community. What does everybody say, the world and the church, when something bad happens? Ever heard this phrase, why is God doing this to me? Or why is God letting this happen to me? Or God hates me? Or God's after me? Listen, isn't that, that's what Israel in the desert, isn't it? didn't they say that over and over and over again? During the desert, God's taking them to the promised land, and what do they say? God brought us out here because he hates us. God brought us out here to kill us. God brought us out here so we could die. Does God take that lightly? No, it bothered God. And it said, you have to have a good opinion. Abraham was able to avoid wavering because he reached a point that he had a good opinion of God. And this new year, I want to re-encourage everybody, we got to have a good opinion of God. Go over with me to, um, in fact, before we, Abraham did not waver. It's the word diakrinio. It's the Greek word diakrinio. It means to discriminate or hesitate because you don't trust. I hesitate because I'm not sure I can trust God. What is that? That's a bad opinion of God. What would you think if somebody's child, their 8-year-old, 10-year-old child, said, well, I don't know if I can trust my dad. Something's wrong there. I don't know if I can trust my mom. I don't know if I can trust my mom to feed me. I don't know if I can trust my dad to protect me. There's a big dog who lives next door, and he sometimes comes in our yard, and I'm not sure I can trust my dad. He might, my dad might be my dad's will for that dog to eat me. Something's wrong in that family. And yet we attribute all that to God. We say God acts that way. We think God is arbitrary, capricious, never know what God. You ever heard the phrase, you never know what God's going to do? Listen, we always know what God's going to do. He's going to do exactly what he said he would do. What we don't know is what people will do. We know what God's going to do. As many as may be the promises of God, in him they are yes and in him they are amen to the glory of God is what it says, to the good reputation of God. God has a good reputation. God can be trusted. Don't teach your children. Don't ever push blame for something negative over on God. I've shared this years ago, but we used to have a couple in the church, not in this church, but just our home church, and they blamed everything on the devil. Anything that happened in their family was the devil. And really what they were saying is God does He can't help us. He can't protect us. Anything that negative happened is the devil. No, if you have a good opinion of God, the devil has no power in your life. The devil has no ability in your life. 
Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Hebrews 3, 7. Hebrews 3, 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion in the day of the trial in the wilderness. He's referring to those Israelites in the desert. He said, don't harden your heart and rebel. How is it they rebelled? Verse 9. Where your fathers tested me, tried me, saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was angry with that generation. They always go in this stray in my hearts. And look what I wanted to focus on, this last part. They have not known my ways. He said, for 40 years, 40 years, I delivered them. I brought them out of Egypt. I brought the plagues on the Egyptians. I brought water from a rock, manna from heaven, quail if, when they wanted meat, the fire at night to lead them, the pillar of cloud, the day to keep them shaded in the desert. Over and over and over, God showed them his goodness. And over and over and over again, they said, God's not good. Over and over, it was God brought us out here to kill us. God, would, are there no graves in Egypt? Why don't we go back to Egypt? We had it better in Egypt. We had it better in the world. They did not have a good opinion of God. He, and it says God was angry with that generation. They always go astray in their heart, not having known my ways. See, if you know God's ways, the Bible said Israel saw his acts. It's in one of the Psalms. Moses knew his ways. See, if you know his ways, if you know his nature, if you know who he is, then you have a good opinion of him. They constantly had a bad opinion of God. Where did this start? Did you ever think about where the bad opinion of God started? Where did this idea of having a bad opinion of God start? Book of Genesis, chapter 3. Book of Genesis. What did the glorious God, the wonderful God do? Think about, think about, I, I, how many of y'all when New Year's rolled around you had to go back to work? Like, oh shoot, I got to go back to work. That was never the design. That was never the design was this garden where fruit trees and, and plants just yielded to you, where water was crisp and you don't need a water filter because it was pure, natural, healthy. The foods were healthy. You had all day to just tend the garden, work in the yard. You, you weren't idle. You weren't sitting around bored. In fact, you couldn't get bored. You were living in this glorious place full of beauty. You worked on your own schedule. In the evening, God had come. You hang out with God. You'd walk in the garden in the cool of the evening. Perfection. God created perfection. He gave the, the man a gorgeous woman. I know it's kind of an old joke, but that's why she's called woman. Because he was asleep when God made her, and that's why women don't, men don't understand women. But um, when he did see her, he's like, whoa, man. And that's what he called her, a woman. I mean, she looked good. She was a perfect match for him. They didn't fight. They didn't have strife. They were in perfect harmony. God saw them as one. God called them one. God called them Adam. It was perfect harmony, perfect peace, perfect joy, perfection. And I believe with all my heart this whole universe was created. God's plan was for Adam and Eve to grow with him and to populate the whole universe and to create and to, and to be like God. Isn't that what he said? He made God and man in his own image. Then who comes? Satan comes and he starts giving them a bad opinion of God. Well, hath God really said, is God, you know, God doesn't want you to eat that tree because he knows if you eat it, you'll be like him. What were they already? Like him. What's the pitch? Well, it's God that's holding you back. It's God that's holding you down. What do, young people are so dumb because they think rebel. I'm rebelling. No, you're going with the flow. When you cuss, drink, smoke, and do all that stuff, when you dye your hair purple and, and get 37 piercings and nine tattoos and you're going, you are in the flow, little kid. You are in the flow. You are going with the crowd. That, see, the devil lied. He convinced them that going with God was somehow less than. How stupid. And we still, our young people still believe that. And our church people still believe that. Church people believe, well, you never know. You can't tell what God's going to do. You can't trust God. 
You can trust God completely, absolutely, 100% of the time. If you believe, you shall receive. What? If you, I, I had this conversation years ago. A, a woman came to our church, and her parents were pastors in, in, a, in a, another state. And her mother had a pretty serious illness. And I was talking about how God wants everybody healed. She goes, well, I know that's not true. I said, well, how do you know that's not true? And she said, well, my mother's not healed. And my mother's the most godly person that I know. And I said, oh, hmm. So let's go over to Mark eleven twenty four. Whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe you receive it, and you shall have it. I said, did your mother desire to be healed? Well, yes. Did your mother pray for healing? Well, yes. Did she believe she received? Oh, absolutely. My mother's got more faith than anybody in the universe. So she prayed, she believed she received, she desired it, and it didn't happen. Therefore, Jesus is a liar. Well, no, 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 Jesus is not a liar. And this is where we stumble over into it. We come over with all these excuses, all these reasons why, well, I know God said, but. I know Jesus said, but in his infinite wisdom, in his great and glorious wisdom, he knows something we don't know. And therefore, he put that in the Bible, but he didn't really always mean it because you can't trust God. See how this bad opinion of God, turn over with me to James chapter 1. This is really kind of the meat of where we're going. James 1, verse 13, James 1, 13. Let no one say when he is tempted. Now that word tempted is parismos. Parismos, it means to test or be in a trial. Let no one say when I am in a test or trial, I am in a test or trial by God. So if you're in a test, if you're in a trial, what is the thing you're not allowed to say? God did it. What do all the Christians say? God did it. Well, he's talking about temptation from sin. Go look up the Greek word. It just means a test or a trial, any stress point. God doesn't use sickness and disease. There is, if God used sickness and disease how, to teach us, how is he going to teach us when we get to heaven? There's none there. He's going to have a really hard time teaching us if that's his choice method of teaching is sickness. Tornadoes, hurricanes. God's really going to go, oh, shoot, now I don't know how to teach them. I don't have hurricanes. I don't have sickness. I don't have disease. How am I going to teach my people? No. How does God always teach his people? By his word, by his grace, by his love. He's always taught us. How do you teach a child? How do you teach a child anything? You tell them, you teach them, you say it to them. When's the last time you saw a parent say, you know what, I need to teach my child to tie her shoes. I'm going to break both arms. Because if I break both her arms, she'll appreciate her arms. And if she appreciates her arms, when those arms heal, in fact, she'll learn two things from me. She'll learn that I love her enough that I'll pay the medical bills for the casts on her arms. And she'll appreciate those arms, which will make her more likely to be willing to learn how to tie her shoes. Y'all are going, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And yet we attribute that to God all the time. Well, God, I, I, I've heard, and, and I remember telling me afterwards, I, I hope she doesn't call me and give me a hard time tomorrow. When, um, when my mom first got saved, she prayed, God, whatever you have to do to save my sons, if you have to cripple them, to save them. Sounds like a godly prayer. It's an asinine prayer. Now, she was a brand new Christian, so no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. God doesn't need to cripple. Remember, we talked about this two weeks ago. Send back a dead person. He said, if they won't believe the scripture, they won't believe a dead person. If they won't believe the scripture, they won't believe when they're crippled. They won't believe when they got cancer. They won't believe when they're dying. They will believe the Bible or they won't believe at all. You either have a good opinion of God and believe his word or nothing else is going to motivate you. What a stupid thing. You, we would lock you up for crippling your child to teach them something. We do lock you up. When you, well, I burned him with a cigarette to teach him not to do such. We lock you up. We call social services. If God was that way, we need to call social services on God. That's what, what, do you, what was the goal of the devil? I shall be like the most high God. What's his goal? He wants to flip places with God. God, devil blesses you and prospers you and gives you a good life. And God kills, steals, and destroys. That is the lie from the Garden of Eden until today. It's a lie from the pit of hell. 
You have to have a good opinion of God. When you have problems, lesson number one, God, he said, don't even say it. I am not, why is God letting this happen to me? God will not let you be tested or tried beyond what you are able, but with the test of the trial will provide a way of escape. That's what the scripture says. God will provide a way of escape. God's not sending the test or the trial. When the test or trial comes, he attaches the escape method to it. You know, we just got back from Germany, and they say if the plane goes down, there's ways to escape. They got those little things that come out on, uh, onto the water. You got the little flotation devices. God is providing the way of escape. Not, God is not providing the test or the trial. He's providing the deliverance. Nothing, there is no test, no temptation, no test that has overcome you except that is common to man, the scripture says. And God attaches. He says, he puts provision. Into, we were just listening to Keith Moore today, Carolyn and I, and he was talking about how God, he, he was believing for a house. And he obeyed God, went to Bible school. Well, this just really struck me today. We were listening to it. And he said he was believing, he, he was, God told him to go to Bible school, sacrifice everything, leave his family behind, leave his job, career, and he went to Raymond Bible School. And he said they were struggling financially for many years. He said, but we had this perfect house that we were believing for. And he said, per, we just... His wife and him had this house they dreamed of. He said, many years later, God provided them that house that they dreamed of. He said, you know when that house was built? The month we decided to go to Reba Bible School. See, God created an intersection, a, a packet of deliverance, a packet of victory along the way. God, God hides along the path. He hides all these little packages. You know, now in the, the survivalist, you have these bug out bags. You know, you hide, you bury stuff. That may or may not do you any good. But God has bug out bags. He has hidden deliverance all over the place. He has deliverance from sickness and disease. He has deliverance from financial problems. And it's all attached to the problem. He said, so, but step one is don't even say it. Don't say it. Don't say, why is God letting this happen to me? Why is God doing this? Don't say it. God does not test or try anyone. Keep going. With evil. But each one is tempted, tested, or tried when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Keep going. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown brings forth death. Okay, now here's what I want to get. Do not be deceived, my brethren. How many of y'all don't want to be deceived? He's about to tell us how to avoid deception. Next verse. Every good gift... And every perfect gift is from above, who comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He said, don't be deceived. From the Father of light only comes good gifts. Only comes perfect gifts. Well, maybe, maybe the car crash and the crippling was a perfect gift. I did get saved afterwards. You know what? You could have gotten saved by the Word of God. God didn't cause it. I have guys in the prison tell me that all the time. Well, God caused me to be arrested so I could find him here in prison. I'm like, no, God caused you to be a God didn't cause you to be arrested. You got arrested because you committed armed robbery. They were looking for you and they found you. The FBI arrested you. You know, you bank, robbed a bank. The FBI, that was not God. You didn't have to find God in here in prison. You could have found him before you robbed the bank. You could have found him 10 years earlier. What I have discovered, people tell me over and over and over again, God sent people across their path when they were 10, when they were 12, when they were 15, when they were 18, and they rejected and rejected it. So yes, now they're in prison. That doesn't mean God put you in prison, and God didn't put you in prison to teach you something. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. So don't say this negative experience is coming from God, because God doesn't use negativity. God is a God of victory. And overcoming, he's not a God of failure. So let's go Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, verse 7. Matthew 7, 7. Now, and, I, and the, the funny thing is, the chapters and verses were added later, but 7 is the perfect number in the Bible. It represents perfection and completion. Notice Matthew 7, 7. Perfected completion. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Does this sound like every good and perfect gift? 
will come down from the Father of light, in whom, notice there is no shifting, no variation. What does that mean, no shifting or variation? God doesn't send one person a good thing and another person a bad thing. There are other religions that believe that, but not true Bible Christianity. God sends light and life. Remember when James and John want to call down fire. What does Jesus say? He says, you don't know which spirit you're of. That's We came to save lives. We came to deliver lives. We didn't come to give cancer and heart disease and diabetes. We didn't come to kill, steal, and destroy. We, Jesus said, I came to give life and to give it abundantly. So he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And him who knocks will be opened. All right. I just proved the Bible's not true right there. Have you ever asked and not received? Well, I have. You ever sought and not found? I have. Have you ever knocked and it not been opened? I have. So the Bible must be lying. No. Why am I not receiving? Why am I not finding? Why am I not getting the door open? Because I don't have a good opinion of God. In fact, let's see what he now discusses. Chapter, verse 9. Or what man is there among you? If his son asks for bread, he will give him a stone. And if he asks for fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will our Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So let's go back. He said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be open. Everyone who asks, receive. Everyone who seeks, finds. And we're going, well, but we're not receiving. We're not. And so what does he do? He says, well, let me explain the problem. He's not done explaining. He said, which of you, go back to verse um, 9. He said, which of you? See, I've been using the equation, the, the you, uh, parent versus God. What we would call child abuse for a parent, we say God will do. How ridiculous. How, ridi how ungodly self-righteous that is. I would never give my child cancer, but God in his loving wisdom, which we don't understand, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared. We don't know what God's going to do, blah, 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 blah. Religion has been doing this for a thousand years, actually almost 1,700 years, and it's still doing it today. Tomorrow morning, in thousands of churches across America, they're going to talk about how God killed somebody, God destroyed something, God did some terrible thing here. My attitude is with the God most Christians preach. Who needs the devil? We, got, we don't need the devil. We got God. He's bad enough as it is. And you know, the devil plays on that. The devil plays on, hey, why do you want to follow him? He is keeping you from being like him. He is holding you back. He is your problem. No, he is the answer to every problem that I have. He said, so he said, why are you not receiving when you ask? Why are you not? And he's going into a good opinion of God. He said, which one among you? This is talking about normal people. If your son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Keep going again. Or he asks for a fish, he will give him a serpent. I think the Luke version says a scorpion. If you then... If you, being evil, he's not saying you're evil like Adolf Hitler. He's going to compare to the perfection of God. God's perfected love, perfected glory. You, who are only good like at this level, and God who is good at a level so high my arm can't reach, the mega God. He said, if you wouldn't do that kind of stuff, how much more would the mega God not do that? How dare you, is literally what he's saying, how dare you say God would do it when you wouldn't do it? You wouldn't do that to your children. You wouldn't treat your children that way. You wouldn't curse them that way. He said, how much more? Doesn't the Bible say God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we can even ask or think by the power that works inside of us? He's drawing this parallel between humans and himself. He says, look, I'm a zillion times better than you. I'm a zillion times kinder than you. I'm a zillion times more loving and more faithful and more honest than you. How dare you think you wouldn't do that, but I would. This is the problem for so many Christians, is we don't have a good opinion of God. We have an okay opinion of God. 
If things are going good, well, okay, God must be blessing me. If things are going bad, well, God's mad at me. And we have this, this schizophrenic opinion of God. Abraham did not waver because he had glory to God. He gave, had a good opinion of God. Stop. Stop for, with this crazy idea. If you're not receiving healing, if I'm not receiving healing, it's not being held up on God's end. If you're not receiving prosperity or I'm not receiving prosperity, it's not being held up on God's end. Well, what's the problem? We're not having a good enough opinion of God. Where's faith come from? What it said, Abraham did not stagger, but grew strong in faith because he had a good opinion of God. So you're not going to build your faith. You're not going to grow in faith if you have a crummy opinion of God. If you don't know what God's going to do, if you don't trust him, if you don't... What is faith? It's just trust. And so this year, I just want to encourage everybody. And I am a chief sinner. I, and I know this stuff. I've known this stuff for 40 years. I've known this stuff, but you still, you get into pressure, you get into crisis, you get into test or trial or temptation, and the, the devil's whispering in your ear, yeah, God's teaching you something. God's got, this is a, there's, God's got some reason for this. No, no, the devil's come to kill, steal, and destroy, destroy, but with the test or trial, there's a way of escape, and that way of escape is in our mega God. He will give you the deliverance. He will give you good things to those who ask him. But in order to receive those good things, we have to have a good opinion of him. It's just hard to receive. How, uh, 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 using this illustration, if a child, Margaret's sitting here on the front row, if my nine-year-old Margaret has a terrible opinion of her father, well, you never know. Sometimes he'll bless you, sometimes he'll hit you. Sometimes Friday night is pizza night in a movie. Sometimes Friday night is beat you with a bat night. Sometimes... You know, Tuesday nights I get to go to dance. Sometimes Tuesday nights he dumps me in a septic system. You just never know what dad's going to do. You laugh because that sounds crazy. Yet isn't that what we attribute to God? Isn't that what we say God does? Didn't that say, oh yeah, you never know. God dumped me in the septic system this week. And then next week he blesses me. No. What kind of relationship would they have? Could she receive from her father if she believed that? If she believed one day it's dance class, the next day it's septic system, one day it's pizza and a movie, the next day it's beaten with a bat. In fact, they, uh, some university did a study among teenagers, and they asked them, which would you prefer? A parent that's abusive, just abuses you, or a parent that you never know. Sometimes they're nice to you, and sometimes they abuse you. You know what the majority of the kids said? I'd rather just have an abusive parent so I know what's coming. Because that's a horrible way to live. It's a horrible way to live to say, okay, well, God is good. God, God is good. You're good. You're, you're good. Please don't hit me. And that's how most Christians live. Most Christians spend their whole life, God is good. Please don't hit me. Oh, he hit me, but that's because he loves me. He beat me. And isn't that what abused children say? A lot of times abused children say that. Well, my dad hits me because he loves me. No, your dad hits you because he's a monster. And God is not a monster. God is not like us. He said, if you wouldn't do that, how much more would your Heavenly Father not do that? So, I talked that last week about having no New Year's resolutions. I changed my mind. Have one New Year's resolution this year. Have a good opinion of God. Don't say, why is God doing this? Don't say, why is God my problem? Don't say, God, where are you? Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Jesus said, I'm with you always to the ends of the age. God will never abandon us. God will never forsake us. God will never hurt us. In fact, the book of Isaiah 54, which is a picture of the church, God said, I will never be angry with you. Isaiah 53 is the cross, and Isaiah 54 is the post-cross church. And in Isaiah 54, he says, I will never be angry with you. I will not judge you. There is no judgment, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He said, if you wouldn't do that, don't even think about attributing it to me. Don't even begin to think you're better than God because you are not. You're not even in the neighborhood. Nobody's in the neighborhood of the goodness of God. And how dare we, how pompous and arrogant we are to think we wouldn't do that, but God does it. And then we create all these goofy theologies. Well, it's just his loving kindness. No, no, no. He doesn't do that sort of thing. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good God. You are a wonderful God. You're faithful 
You're loyal. You never leave us. You never abandon us. You said even if we're faithless, you remain faithful. You said that in your word. Lord, we thank you that you are good, that you answer our prayers, that you hear our cry, that you are, that this is our anthem of grace, that your grace is always over us. Amazing grace, how sweet that sound. You saved us and we're your children and all good and perfect gifts come from you and no, no test or trial is from you, but with every test or trial this year, you've already provided the way of escape and we believe we receive it. We ask you to bless the food and the fellowship and everything else we do this evening in Jesus' name. Amen.